Okay, welcome back to our next chapter in uh, our video series. Uh, this video we will cover chapter 5, uh, Tissues and Systems, the Inside Story. All right, a brief introduction. Uh, cells, of course, are the build, basic building blocks of the body. And then cells are going to be organized into uh, what their functions are. So cells that have similar functions are called tissues. Now a combination of tissues that are designed to have a uh, specific function is then called an organ. And then when you have organs working together, you have organ systems, such as cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and so on. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter, uh, be able to explain the relationship between cells, tissues, organs, and systems. Uh, list and describe the four main types of tissue. Uh, be able to identify and describe the various body membranes. Uh, be able to differentiate uh, the three types of muscle, uh, muscle tissue. Uh, be able to describe the main components of nervous tissue. Uh, be able to list and describe the main functions of the body systems. And lastly, provide general examples of how uh, pathologic conditions can have an impact on cells, tissues, organs, and body systems. All right, we'll start with uh, tissues. As a a collection of similar cells that have a similar functions. You can imagine cells as being bricks that are placed in a very particular pattern to create a functional wall of a building. So it's the same same setup for uh, cells and tissues. These cells are the basic building components of that uh, of that organ. Now all tissues in the body fall into one of four categories: epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. And we'll talk about all four of these in this video. All right, the first one we'll talk about, epithelial tissue. This is a tissue that will cover and line most of the body, and also will cover most or many of the body parts found in the body. Now, in this type of tissue, you have cells that are very tightly uh, packed together, and they usually will form a, a sheet of cells, a sheet of tissue. And this type of tissue will be uh, avascular. That means you will not find blood vessels within it. Now, epithelial tissue is classified by their arrangement of their cells and their shape of the cells. When cells are going to be uh, flat and scale-like, they're called uh, squamous. Think of these as a, a pancake. They're very flat, they're very squished down, uh, so those are squamous cells. When they're shaped like a cube, they're called cuboidal. When they're shaped like a column, you know, they're longer than they are wide, uh, they're columnar. So think of columns, uh, say on a courthouse building, for example. And ones that are uh, very stretchy and they can vary their shape greatly, yeah, they're called transitional. And these are only found in the urinary tract. So they're only found in the uh, ureters, the urethra, and in the urinary bladder. And there are some terms that are used to describe how these are uh, laid out. When cells are arranged in a single layer, that's called simple. So you can have a simple squamous. You can have a simple cuboidal. You can have a simple columnar. So all simple references is how many layers of tissues there are. So simple is always a reference to one. If there's more than one, it's then called stratified. So if they give a, a stratus is another word for a layer. So multiple layers of cells. So you can have stratified squamous. You can have stratified cuboidal. You can have stratified columnar. Now there is an exception to this. It's a type of tissue called a pseudostratified columnar. At first glance, it may look like it's stratified, but it isn't because of the different cell uh, shapes and cell sizes. So that's why it's called pseudo-stratified. Pseudo means uh, false or fake. So it's falsely stratified columnar. Right, here are some examples of where these tissue types uh, can be found. Let's see, uh, simple squamous. You find them in the air sacs of the lungs for uh, simple diffusion, for gas exchange. Uh, simple cuboidal, you find these in uh, the kidneys, for example. Uh, simple columnar in the uh, digestive tract, in the intestines. Uh, stratified squamous, you'll find these in the, uh, the lining of the mouth and then the outer laying of the epidermis because they offer more protection because you have multiple layers of tissue here. Uh, stratified cuboidal, uh, commonplace for those, you'll find them in the uh, larger sweat glands, that's why it's coming out of the, uh, the armpit here. And pseudostratified columnar, uh, usually the best place you'll find those are the uh, upper respiratory tract. Uh, talk about membranes. Membranes are uh, sheet-like structures that are found uh, throughout the body and have uh, very particular functions. And these can be classified as organs because they are groups of tissues working together with a particular function, so they could be classified as an organ. You have a epithelial membrane, will have a, a layer of epithelial tissue, and a bottom layer will have a special type of connective tissue. The epithelial membranes can be uh, one of three kinds, uh, cutaneous, 
Uh, cutaneous is reference to skin. Uh, they be serous. There are two types of those, parietal and visceral. Mucus. Now these terms here, parietal and visceral, those are uh, general terms in anatomy. Whenever something is visceral, that means it's contacting an organ directly. If something is parietal, that means it's lining a cavity. And you'll see these terms come up again as we get into uh, other body systems throughout this video series. Right, here's a, a summary of the three different types of uh, epithelial membranes. Uh, cutaneous. Of course, I said the cutaneous is always referenced to skin. So think of the skin kind of draping over all of your internal structures. Uh, serous will have a two-layered membrane with a very small potential space in between those. And we'll talk about that set up again when we talk about the lungs. And of course, mucous uh, membranes, like the name implies, they make mucus. So they're there to uh, line the openings of your body from the outside world so things shouldn't get inside your body that shouldn't be there. That's why mucus is uh, so thick and sticky, so it can trap things from entering your body. Some uh, common locations of serous and mucous membranes. You, know, you find the serous membranes in the pleura, which wrap around the lungs. Uh, see the pericardium, uh, peritoneum, uh, the gastric uh, lining of the intestines. We'll talk about all of these in future videos. This is more of an anterior view of the parietal and visceral pleura, which wrap around the lungs. All right, connective tissue. This is the most common type of tissue and the heaviest uh, type of tissue by weight when you compare with uh, the four different tissue types. Now, this would be found in organs and in bones and nerves and muscles and membranes and skin. And one of the biggest things they do is they hold things together. And they also provide uh, structure and support. This is the type of tissue that will uh, cover things like bone and blood. So people don't tend to think of blood being a type of tissue or bone being a type of tissue. But those two fall under the overall category of connective tissue. All right, in this type of tissue, you have uh, fine, delicate webs of loosely connected tissue and a mix of very strong cord-like structures that are similar to uh, wire cables. And in this type of tissue, you have ligaments and tendons that are composed of you know, really dense connective tissue. And then uh, fat is also an example of connective tissue. Here are some just a very few examples of the, all the different types of connective tissues that we have. You know, loose connective tissue that, that bind the skin to the uh, muscles and tissues underneath it. Uh, dense connective tissue is found in, say, the dermis. Loose connective tissue, such as fat. Uh, tendons have the dense connective tissue. Uh, cartilage, all those are different types of, of connective tissue, and there's various types of cartilages. Uh, bone also, blood also. So there are a very large number of classifications for connective tissue. All right, the synovial membrane. This is the membrane type that is associated with uh, connective tissue. Now, this is an important membrane that's found uh, in the spaces between uh, where two bones form a joint or form an articulation. And this type of membrane will secrete a type of fluid called synovial fluid. And this fluid will help reduce friction and wear and tear on the bones. So that's why you're able to bend your knee and bend your elbow you know, and flex your hip without having it hurt you know, too much. As that synovial fluid gets worn away, or not produce as much, it has the same function as oil in your car's engine. If the oil isn't there, it's going to produce a lot of damage. If this fluid isn't there, it will create a lot of damage to your joints. Okay, here's an example. Uh, the thigh bone or the femur here, and the two lower leg bones is the shin here, and the fibula right here. This type of joint is wrapped around in a synovial capsule, and the space in between these two bones where they meet is filled with fluid. If that fluid wasn't there, these two bones would rub against each other. And there are other layers of uh, protective coatings in between those two also. You have the articular cartilage here and also here. And there are other types of uh, tissues kind of scattered throughout this capsule to help protect the bones. But that fluid is what helps keep these able to be able to bend all the time and not rub on each other. All right, next we'll talk about muscle tissue. Of course, muscle will provide movement or locomotion. This is the only type of tissue that has the ability to contract itself, or shorten itself, or contractility. Uh, there are three types of muscles that we have in our body. We have skeletal, uh, cardiac, and smooth. Now, I'll start with the most obvious one. When you think of muscle, you probably will think of skeletal muscle. This type of muscle is called uh, striated because it has a, a striped appearance. And this is due to alternating bands of light and or thin and thick uh, muscle filaments. So you get the appearance of it being light and dark, light, dark, light, dark. So it looks like the muscle is actually striped 
but it's called striated. Of course, the skeletal muscle will attach to bones, and this is how you're able to move by the muscles uh, contracting and then relaxing. That's all muscles can do. They can get shorter or go back to normal. You know, they can pull, but they can't push. You'll find a skeletal muscle around the openings of the body, such as in the mouth, which will control the size of that opening. And in skeletal muscle, you'll find the muscle cells or the muscle fibers will be uh, long and in a tube-like shape. And you'll find many nuclei in each cell. Now, it's the brain that will control uh, muscle contraction. And that process we'll talk uh, in greater detail a little bit later on. Because skeletal muscles are able to be controlled by you consciously, they're called voluntary muscles. You can choose to pick up a, a cup or put it down. You are choosing to you know, walk across the room or walk back. You have conscious control over what your muscles do. So that's called voluntary muscles. And of the three types of muscles that we have, this is the only type that is considered voluntary. The other two are not under your control, so they are involuntary. All right, move on to the next type of muscle, a cardiac muscle. You know, like the name indicates, it's only found in the walls of the heart. The cardiac is referenced to the heart. Now, the heart beats without your conscious control. There are countless things that goes on that go on in your body that you have no physical conscious control of, and your heartbeat is one of them. So your cardiac muscle is considered to be involuntary. You can't control how quickly your heart beats or how often or with what force of contraction. You don't control that. Your brainstem does. Now the cells in the cardiac muscle will interlock with one another, and this will make for a very, or a much more efficient uh, con contraction with the muscle tissue, which is what you want when you want your heart to beat more effectively. All right, the last of the three, smooth muscle. This will form the walls of the hollow organs, such as the uh, digestive system and blood vessels. Also, again, it's like with cardiac, you have no control over this type of muscle or their activity. So these are considered involuntary, just like cardiac. Now cells within smooth muscle will be long, but they're not going to be as long as skeletal tissue. And they only, they only will have one nucleus. And their shape will kind of uh, bulge out in the middle, and they kind of taper off on the ends. It's called a, a fusiform shape. So they'll be long, but not long and slender like a tube. They bulge and get thicker in the middle. Okay, here's a summary of the three different types of muscle. The cardiac here on top, of course only found in the heart. And their fibers will be branched. That's how they're able to interconnect one another to make a more efficient contraction. A skeletal a muscle, in a muscle that you think of you know, for movement, you're long and tube-like. You'll have many nuclei in every cell. And you can see the alternating light and dark patterns here due to the thick and thin filaments. And smooth muscle and the intestinal walls or the softer organs, one large nuclei, and the fibers start off kind of narrow, then bulge up in the middle and taper back off again. And it's a summary of their appearance and uh, how they're controlled. See both uh, smooth muscle, involuntary, heart, or cardiac, involuntary. The only one of these three that is not striated in appearance is smooth muscle. It looks smooth compared to the other two. So skeletal and cardiac are striated. Smooth is not. Uh, skeletal is the only voluntary controlled muscle. The other two are involuntary. All right, next we'll talk about uh, nervous tissue. Of course, this will act as a, a rapid messenger service for the body. Okay, this is how your brain talks to the rest of your body and then vice versa. So in order for things to get done, things have to be able to talk to one another. There are two main types of cells in the nervous tissue. You have the main uh, structural unit of the nervous system, the neuron. And neurons are made up of uh, various branches that come off of a cell body. The main structure that carries information away from its cell body is called the axon. So think of A for axon, A for away. And then the, br the branches that will receive information from other neurons to be processed to the cell body are called dendrites. So information goes into dendrites, it gets processed by the cell body, and the signal gets sent out away from the neuron through the axon. All right, the neuron is one main type of cell in this system, or in this tissue type. Uh, the other type are called the neuroglial cells. These are to support and nourish the neurons. And there are a large variety of different types of glial cells. Uh, now, many nerves have a very specialized a combination of uh, fat and protein that wrap around uh, the axon. And this uh, protective layer is called uh, myelin. Now, many nerves have this myelin covering, but not all of them. It just depends on where they are. 
and a smile on its teeth is also there to uh, not only to protect the neuron, but to or to help the information get processed faster. Axons that are covered with myelin, the impulse will travel about 10 times as fast as they would if they were not covered with myelin. You also will find uh, very specialized uh, membranes that will cover the brain and the spinal cord, and they're called meninges. And there are three different types of those. So when you hear someone who has meningitis, it's one of those three layers that are uh, infected. Right, here's a very common uh, picture of a neuron here. And these little black specks all, are all, all around it, those are the supporting cells or the glial cells. And there are six types of those depending on what function you're talking about and what division of the nervous system you're talking about. So these individual branches here, these are called, are called uh, dendrites. They will receive information, go toward the cell body, or the nucleus here. Then you have one axon leaving away from the cell body. So it's very common to find multiple dendrites, but you only find one axon in a neuron. And in this illustration, you see these uh, sections of the axon that are covered with this yellow uh, material, that would be the myelin. So that's a group of myelin, there's a space, there's a group of myelin here, there's a space, and another group of myelin here. It's that myelin coating that will protect the axon underneath and will also to help move the impulse uh, faster down the axon. And I'll talk about exactly how this works in a future video. Now like I mentioned a second ago, meningitis. This is the inflammation of the meninges. These are the membranes that will cover the brain or the spinal cord. This can be caused by either a virus or a bacteria. Now the bacterial form can spread uh, via droplets by someone sneezing or coughing, or if you're in contact with the saliva of someone who is infected already. Uh, people who are at a higher risk to contract meningitis, military personnel who tend to be in you know, large crowded situations, uh, college students, Going to be large crowded situations. Uh, once you are infected, uh, you will become a carrier of that disease. Now, only some people who become carriers will actually develop the disease. In others, the immune system will take out whatever is causing that disease before you can develop any symptoms at all. So, just because you may contract it doesn't mean that you're going to get it. All right, some symptoms of uh, meningitis fever, nausea, a very stiff neck is usually a good sign that you have meningitis. A skin rash, and some nonspecific headaches. Uh, some other symptoms, kidney failure, uh, hearing loss, uh, brain damage of course, loss of limb, these are a little bit more uh, of the severe symptoms. Now the bacterial form of meningitis will have a, a, a death rate of about 10%. So 10% who develop a bacterial meningitis will die, end up dying. Now there is a vaccine that is available for prevention, but it, it does not protect against all pathogens that cause meningitis. Remember, there are multiple ways to get meningitis. It could be viral, it could be bacterial. It also has been, or vaccine for this has also been associated with uh, headaches, dizziness, vomiting, convulsions, and even death. So yes, there is a vaccine available for meningitis, but the side effects may not be worth it, or they may not prevent all types of meningitis from being created, or from being developed. So it may be worth it, it may not be worth it. Now right now, a vaccine is not mandatory for high-risk groups, but people should weigh the risk and benefits on setting whether or not you want to get it. Because it's, it's possible you may contract the disease and never develop symptoms. Uh, the vaccine may not protect you from the kind that you contracted. You know, if you get a vaccine for a viral kind and get the bacterial meningitis, it won't do any good. You may get some severe reactions to the vaccine. Uh, other people may not, but you might. So it, it just depends. Uh, if you think if it's worth it or not to be vaccinated. All right, now we'll move on to organs. This is a result of two or more different types of tissue that are working together with a similar function, and a similar function that the tissues on their own can't do. So some of these will occur uh, in pairs, some of these will occur singly. You know, a pair of lungs, those are an organ. A pair of kidneys, those are organs. Some organs only appear in one instance. You have one brain, you have one heart. So organs can be either in pairs or by themselves. And there are some organs that are vital that you cannot live without. You can't live without your heart. You can live with some of your brain, but you can't live without all of it. You can live with one lung, but you can't live without both of them. You can you can't live without one kidney, but you can't live without both. So some organs you have to have at least at some level in order to survive. Now other organs, it can be removed and not be that big a deal. 
You can live without your appendix. You can live without your spleen or your gallbladder. Because they are organs, yes, but they are a part of a larger system. So other parts of that system take over what that organ's role was. So that's why you can lose an appendix and or gallbladder or a spleen and not be that big of a deal. Here's a table of uh, some systems and some organs in the, in the human body. The integumentary uh, body system, which is you know, the skin and the nails and the hair and different types of glands within the, the skin. Some common uh, terminology terms that will, will be found when talking about the system, such as uh, seb or sebo or pseudo, uh, cutaneous or cutano, dermo. All those are reference to the integumentary system. For musculoskeletal, of course, muscles, joints, bones, and some common prefixes you'll find there. Arthro, osteo, myo, or musculo, endocrine, of course, all the structures that make hormones throughout the body. Some very common prefixes you'll find there. So, pituo, testo, adreno, pancreo, the system we'll talk more about in a future video also. Uh, cardiovascular, the heart and the blood and the blood vessels. The cardio, uh, hema or hemo is a reference to blood. Arterio, uh, veno or phleb or phlebo, all reference to vessels. Uh, the lymphatic and the immune system. Uh, the spleen and the thymus gland and lymph nodes. Uh, lympho, thymo, spleno, uh, respiratory. Of course, nose, pharynx, larynx, uh, lungs, uh, some common uh, combining forms, you know, bronco, uh, pneumo, tracheo, so on. Uh, the gastrointestinal, from the mouth all the way down through the uh, intestines and the liver and the gallbladder, pharyngeo, esophago, gastro, entero, urinary, uh, kidneys, uh, ureters, bladder and urethra, uh, nephro, uh, or reno for kidneys, the urethro, uh, urido, so on. The so uro is always reps to urine. See a reproductive system, and ovaries, uterus, fallopian tubes, vagina, uh, mammaries uh, for females, uh, testes, prostate, urethra, uh, and males. And again, some common uh, combining forms: utero, uh, hystero, vagino, mammo, uh, orchid, uh, prostato, urethro, uh, nervous system, the brain, uh, spinal cord, nerves, neuro or myelo or spino or encephalo. All those reference uh, to the nervous system. And the general senses in general, like the eyes and the ears. Being able to hear and see and smell and taste and touch. Uh, for the eyes, uh, ophthalmo, like ophthalmology. Oculo for eyes. Uh, ears is auto. So these series of images that, that are a part of this table all had various body systems, all had various organs that you'll find in that body system. Uh, some very common combining forms, the prefixes you find associated with that body system. And also the various medical specialties that go with some of those body systems. Again, not a, a cumulative list of everything possible, but these are some good examples of common terms you'll find with these body systems. All right, that takes us to our next topic in this chapter, uh, body systems. These are formed when organs work together to have a more complex uh, function than any organ can do by itself. So you have multiple organs working together. You know, a cardiovascular system, a you know, digestive system, a nervous system. It's not just one organ, it's many organs with their own particular job working together for an overall complex function. And of course, each one is interrelated, often depending on another body system to work properly. Nothing in your body works in a vacuum. If you affect your, say your heart and your cardiovascular system, well, that's gonna impact your, your kidney function. That's gonna impact your respiration, you know, the rate and, and depth of how you breathe. That's gonna impact your hormonal levels. So nothing works by itself. If you screw with one thing, you're going to screw up two or three other things or more. So everything is always going to be interconnected. I'll start with the skeletal system. Uh, the functions, of course, uh, provide support and structure for the body. Uh, to provide protection of the internal organs. Uh, provide movement. Your muscles have to attach to something so you're able to be moved. Uh, so muscles will attach to bone. Will store a large variety of minerals. And also will produce blood cells. All of your blood cells, the white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, all of those are formed within bone in a very particular place within longer bones. Uh, the main components of the skeletal system is not just the bones themselves, but it's the bones and ligaments and joints and cartilages. All those together are components of the system. Uh, here's a generic overview of the skeletal system. Well, there are approximately 206 bones. It will have a variety of different shapes and sizes. Uh, muscular system, of course, the voluntary muscles. These are movements that are produced by conscious thought. You are deciding to pick up a drink or put it back down or pick up a book and put it down or to walk across a room. 
that you have conscious control over those. Those are voluntary muscles. And then she has these skeletal muscles that are attached to bones. Those are voluntary. And then you have some that are involuntary, which we talked about earlier in this video. You know, the, the cardiac muscle, the smooth muscle. Those are things that you can't control. You'll find some of these involuntary muscles in airways, uh, some of the softer organs, uh, in blood vessels, for example. And we talked about this earlier. Uh, three different types of muscle. Uh, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Differ in many ways, especially in how they're controlled and how they appear. The generic image of a skeletal muscle. And they're over 640 muscles in the body. Some are quite large, some are relatively small. Uh, the integumentary system. This will include the, the first line of defense that your body has, you know, the skin. And the skin is what will help regulate uh, your body temperature through the sweating when you get too warm or shivering when you get too cold. And does that by changes in the diameter of the blood vessels within the skin. This is also a key way for your body to receive information from the outside world, tr relay that information to the brain. So being able to detect cold and heat and pain and pressure all comes from various sensors throughout the skin. Also scattered throughout the skin, you have various uh, kinds of glands to help to make the skin more waterproof and to lubricate the skin, and also to help inhibit the growth of uh, certain kinds of uh, bacteria. Now, the overall layer of your skin is slightly acidic, and a lot of bacteria don't like that, so they don't want to grow on your skin because they can't handle that kind of environment. The main components of the integumentary system aren't just the skin, but it's the skin and the nails and the hair and all the different kinds of glands throughout the skin sweat glands and the sebaceous glands, the oil glands. Of course you're sewing in the standard anatomical position, hair or skin, uh, sweat glands like in the armpit, uh, nails like in fingernails and toenails, and sebaceous glands. Uh, nervous system will send and receive messages uh, stimulated by the body's internal and external environments affecting how you perceive your world and how you react to that world. So everything that you hear, everything that you see, everything that you touch and taste and feel all those are that information is turned to an electrical impulse to be sent to the brain. Uh, the main parts of the system, uh, the neurons, the nerve cells we talked about earlier, uh, the spinal cord, uh, spinal fluid, the peripheral nerves, and of course the brain being the most important part of that system. Uh, the sensory organs, the organs that you use to detect uh, sensory information, uh, the eyes, nose, tongue, skin, and the ears, being able to receive sensory information. Now, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you tasting? Processing that information and to the brain and then having a brain react to that. The brain up here, the spinal cord, right down the, the backbone here. All the things that branch off of the spinal cord are the peripheral nerves. And of course, we'll get into this in much greater detail in a future video. Uh, the endocrine system, other than the nervous system, it's the main control center of, of all the activity that your body has. It's the endocrine glands that will release a chemical messengers called hormones that will circulate throughout the body you know, within the blood to control basically everything that your body does. All metabolic processes, you know, how you break down fats and lipids and proteins and how you grow, how you reproduce, how your tissue repairs itself. Everything that your body can do is really controlled by the endocrine system. It also helps to uh, regulate the fluid and electrolyte uh, balance within uh, the body. It helps you cope with uh, stresses such as you know, trauma or infections in general. Uh, the main components of the system, uh, the hypothalamus, uh, pineal gland, pituitary gland, all those are in the brain, uh, the thyroid, parathyroid, uh, thymus, uh, the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys, uh, the pancreas, and then the gonads, plus a very large variety of hormones. Right, here are some of those uh, structures and their location. The hypothalamus up here, uh, pituitary gland, of the master gland of the whole system, you know, pineal gland, the thymus, right about here, uh, thyroid, just below the uh, voice box, pancreas, just behind the stomach, the adrenals, right on top of the kidneys. Uh, for females, uh, the ovaries, and of course, in males, uh, the testes. See the cardiovascular system, also known as the circulatory system, the main transport system of the body. It's how things get delivered to your cells, wastes, and Material is taken away from the cells. So things like water and oxygen and sugars and other varieties of nutrients have to get delivered to your cells in order for your cells to be able to use them. Then once they're used, there has to be a way for your cells to get rid of its garbage, its, its waste. So it's all done by the cardiovascular system. Of course, the main components, uh, the heart, different kinds of vessels, arteries and veins, uh, capillaries, and the blood also. Of course, the heart right here, uh, the vessels are in red 
will carry blood with oxygen, usually arteries. The ones that are in blue are the vessels that carry blood without oxygen. They're usually veins, but there is one big exception to that rule. We'll talk about those later on. All right, next we'll talk about a pathology connection, uh, septicemia. It's also called septus or blood poisoning. This is a condition where a pathogen is present in the blood. Anytime you see the ending emia here, emia, that means within the blood. Because blood is needed by all body systems, a septus can be a very serious multi-system infection. So the blood can easily spread from bacteria to organs relatively quickly. And once bacteria grows in organs, they can continue to grow, which will impact that organ's functions. And when organs can't function, then they can't you know, do their job. If they can't do their job, they will die. If too many organs fail, then you will die. Two types here, uh, septus syndrome, is where the infection causes a decrease in blood uh, perfusion to organs, along with other systemic signs. So the infection is decreasing the amount of blood that your organs are able to get. If they can't get enough blood, then they can't get enough oxygen, so they can't function as effectively as they should. You also have septic shock, this is when you have a decreased perfusion to organs, which causes a uh, drop in blood pressure, which is something that you definitely do not want to happen. You also have uh, what's called MODS, Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome, or MODS, uh, can develop if septic shock is not quickly treated and effectively treated. And the reason why this is so serious, as the number of the organs that are infected gets higher, the rate of mortality increases. So if you have this condition going on for three or four days or longer, the patient will, is, is almost certain to die because you have too many organs failing at the same time. So the longer something like this goes on and left untreated or not treated effectively, it can become very, very serious relatively quickly. Uh, some signs uh, and symptoms related to uh, sepsis, uh, fever, chills, tachypnea, uh, tachycardia, skin lesions. Uh, the prefix tachy means fast. So tachycardia means a, a fast heart rate. Tachypnea is a fast breathing. So your body is trying to compensate by breathing faster, heart rate beating faster to get blood to the organs that it isn't reaching like it normally would. You can also have a diffused redness of the skin, either in small areas of the body or widespread areas of the skin. Hypoxemia and also changes in mental status. Whenever your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, your mind starts to get a little fuzzy, a little blurry because you aren't thinking clearly. That's due to the lack of oxygen. Hypo, less than or lower than. Uh, hypox is reference to uh, oxygen. So a low oxygen within the blood. Uh, the respiratory system, it will supply the cells with fresh oxygen that your cells have to have in order to function. And it will get rid of carbon dioxide also because carbon dioxide is toxic to your body. The system will also uh, warm and filter and moisten the air we breathe. The uh, mucus lining of the main airway will help to trap uh, things that shouldn't be going into your lungs from getting to your lungs. That's why you have hair in your nose. That's why you have a mucous membrane lining in the, the nasal cavity to trap the larger particles and bacteria from even getting to, into your lungs. The system is also a key factor in maintaining the proper acid-base balance of your blood. You don't want your blood to become too acidic or too uh, alkaline. Your blood can only handle a very small window of a pH uh, difference, so you don't want it to be too high or too low. So the respiratory system helps to, uh, one of the main systems to help control this. Uh, the main parts of the system, uh, the pharynx, which is your throat, uh, larynx, your voice box, the trachea, uh, the bronchial tubes, and then of course the lungs. Right. Generic image of the respiratory system, mouth and nose here, nasal cavity right behind the nose, the pharynx, uh, the trachea, to main branches of the trachea, the bronchi, and then the lungs. Very deep internally into the lungs, the air sacs, the alveoli, where all the gas exchange happens right here. The lymphatic system, this is responsible for maintaining a proper fluid balance within your body and also to protect it from infection. You have very special structures called uh, lymph nodes that will act as filters to help collect and capture unwanted uh, infectious agents like viruses, like bacteria. Now this system is also responsible for producing infection-fighting white blood cells called lymphocytes. And as the major parts of the system, the lymph vessels, uh, the lymph ducts, uh, lymph nodes, uh, the thymus, uh, the tonsils, and the spleen. The main structures here are the tonsils, here at the back of the throat here. Green structures look like grapes are the lymph nodes, and they're scattered throughout the body. The thymus here. This would be a, 
a close-up view of the inside of one lymph node, and of course the spleen over here on the left-hand side of the body. Our next system, the digestive system, or the gastrointestinal. This will help break down the food that you eat to be able to turn it into a usable source of fuel for your cells, including the mechanical and chemical breakdown of your food. So turning a big bite of pizza into smaller bits of pizza that your body can use. It also will transport waste. So whatever your body can't absorb or digest or just can't use in, in general will be pushed through and turned into feces. Uh, the main parts of the system, the mouth, the pharynx, uh, the esophagus, the stomach, uh, the intestines, both large and small, uh, the accessory organs like the gallbladder and pancreas and liver, and the anal canal. Is there an overview of that system? You have different uh, salivary glands here, the parotids and submandibular and sublinguals, of course the mouth, the esophagus goes down through the stomach, then small intestine here, large intestine here, and then whatever isn't used by the body or is not wanted by the body gets turned into feces and then goes out the anal canal. Alright, next we'll talk about another pathology connection uh, with body image. I'll talk about obesity. Now, the United States uh, population is becoming increasingly more overweight every single year. So there are there's a current generation of adolescents that will potentially have a, a shorter lifespan than their parents because they are becoming obese much earlier in life. Uh, anorexia nervosa this is a condition where there's a progressive and severe weight loss. Uh, patients will often deny that they have a problem, which is not surprising. The people who have this condition are will either avoid eating at all or will eat too little in order to sustain a healthy weight. Uh, bulimia, this is where a person will eat, usually have eating binges where they eat a ton of food all in one sitting, but then they force themselves to vomit that food up or they will use laxatives to avoid gaining weight. So bulimics will, will eat, but they will not allow their body to absorb the nutrients because they don't give it time to be absorbed in the body. They will force it out either by vomiting it up or by, uh, by defecating it out faster than it normally would. Here's a good example of a, of a patient that does have a body image of being overweight. What the rest of the world sees is one thing, but what they see is completely different. So someone with a, an altered body image may see someone very, very overweight, very uh, obese, but the reality may be completely different. So that's why they can't see themselves as being thin like everyone else can or being a normal weight like everyone else can because their their mind will let them see that person. Uh, the urinary system will play an important role with eliminating electrolytes and drugs and waste products and excess water. So again, whatever your body can't absorb or can't use or doesn't want will get filtered in the system and then urinated out. The main uh, functions of the system uh, of course, you regulate the amount of water in the body, uh, blood pressure regulation, uh, the regulation of uh, red blood cells, and electrolyte balance. If you urinate too many out, that's a bad thing. If you don't urinate enough out, that's a bad thing. And also to control acid-base balance. Uh, main parts of the system, uh, kidneys, ureters, uh, the bladder, and then the urethra. And again, all the system is, is the kidneys, which help to form the urine. They'll, that urine will be collected through the uh, ureters, going to the bladder, than out the urethra. In, in males, the urethra is about four times as long as it would be for females. A reproductive system, often combined with the urinary system, uh, to make the GU system or uh, genitourinary system. Of course, the system function, main function is to produce more people, you know, make new humans. Uh, for the female, the main parts of the system are the ovaries, uh, the eggs, the fallopian tubes, uh, uterus, and the vagina. And for males, uh, the penis, the sperm, and then the testes. We have the penis, uh, testes, where the sperm cells are made. And for females, uh, uterus, uh, fallopian tubes, and then the ovaries, and the end of those. And of course the vagina here. All right, that brings us to the end of this video uh, for this chapter number five. And the last uh, several slides, we talked about the various body systems. We just covered a very brief introduction to all of the body systems. We'll get into each body system in much greater detail in future videos of this course. We will end this video here, and we will continue. We'll continue on with uh, chapter six next.